So earlier this week, I participated in an online simultaneous exhibition featuring seven-time Argentine champion Grandmaster Diego Flores. There were 23 boards in my section with players from all over the world, which was really cool to see. In this video, we're going to analyze my game from that simul. I thought there were some really cool takeaways, so let's get right into it. So my game started with knight f3. I'd done a little bit of prep and I found that Grandmaster Diego uh, seemed to be playing more positional setups with c4 or d4, at least in his online bullet games. So I was prepared to transpose into a queen's gambit declined, but um, then he fiancated his bishop and suddenly we were in a Catalan. Okay. Now, of course, I've studied the Catalan and I've played against it, so I knew some theory, of course, but uh, I usually tend to play a more tactical line. I think I learned it from Eric Rosen with takes here and then bishop b4 check and c5 to hang on to it. Um, it can get pretty tricky and tactical, but I knew a grandmaster obviously wasn't going to fall for any opening tricks in the first 10 moves. So I opted to play a more solid line and get my king to safety, plan to blunt this strong bishop a bit so I didn't have to worry about tactics along this diagonal. My moves were fine, but they were a little bit inaccurate. I'm up a pawn. <laughs> so white is already much better here. I think mostly because I put my bishop on this vulnerable square and I had to waste a turn moving it which in the opening is not good. You should aim to get all of your minor pieces out, move them all at least once before you move any of them twice. I also considered leaving it to be captured, which would have given me two pawns in the center, um, but I didn't want to leave white with the bishop pair because the position could easily open up and those bishops would be really strong. So I took the L and I moved it back. White prepared to fianchetto the other bishop and I played c6 to sort of take the sting out of this bishop and control the square in front of this pawn, which might become a target eventually. I didn't really want white to push and try and trade it off, which would again take pawns off the board and open up for those strong bishops. Now white gets his knight to this nice kind of outpost square where it controls a lot of space on my side of the board and I can't immediately kick it back with a pawn. So I brought my knight back to immediately try and trade it off, and he retreated, which was a move I didn't even really consider. Now, my time situation was already a little less than ideal, uh, and now I had to come up with plans in a slightly worse position where white had a bunch of very easy winning ideas, and my pieces were already feeling super cramped. So just to build up some time on my clock, I played some waiting moves, just trying to get my major pieces into the game a little bit but the pressure was mounting. Um, I'd been eyeing this juicy d5 square for my knight for a little bit, and I finally ended up just jumping there. I was struggling to come up with a concrete plan, which is a big problem because that means my pieces aren't coordinated all toward a common goal. But still, I was safe and relatively solid. He wasn't gonna break down my pawn wall anytime soon. So he does play e4, he kicks my pieces back, and he starts coordinating an attack. Now, I didn't really mind if he took this bishop because, I mean, look at it, it's my worst piece. It's staring at the back of my own pawns and it's really just getting in my way. But on the other hand, because the position is really closing up, his knights are very strong here. They can jump around these pawns, they can fork my pieces that are all sort of in a cluster, and they just control a lot more space on my side of the board. So of course he doesn't want to trade one of his best pieces, or one of my worst pieces. So instead, he opted to solidify the position even more and he continued to build pressure and just move forward. All I could really do at this point was kind of shuffle my pieces, try to untangle and wait around for the inevitable. Now he didn't see this, but look at this brilliant sequence that the computer spits out. So here, instead of retreating to avoid the trade, Stockfish wanted knight takes f7. Yeah, so if the king takes, which seems pretty natural, like it's a free knight, uh, now knight takes e6, forking the queen and the rook, and the king can't take, right, because it's protected by this queen. And if we move the queen to save it, say here, then it's just mate. Like you don't even take the rook, you just go check, right, discover check by the queen, and mate. Yeah, it's absolute insanity. Luckily, we did not go into that line, um, but that's why having enemy pieces in your territory can be so dangerous, right? It just 
opens up so many more possibilities for tactics like that. Now I took here, which I didn't realize at the time was a big mistake. It just gives white just this monstrous center and it opens up this file here so that white can more easily attack this weak backwards pawn. Um, I moved this rook up thinking I could eventually double on this semi-open file. And this also adds another layer of protection to this pawn because if this pawn dies, then everything in my position is just about to collapse. Now, I was happy to see this pawn push because it finally allowed me to jump safely and occupy this outpost square in the middle of the board. My knight is very happy here, right? And even if the bishop takes, I can just shut down the center completely and plan to sort of sneak around and attack this overextended wall of pawns from the back. Feeling quite cramped, I will say. And my knight's pretty nice there. So white jumps here, I save my rook, and then white goes over here, which probably is preparing to push f5, which will undermine the support of my knight. But I was so sick of my cramped position that I just tried to sneak out kind of with queen a5, maybe planning to infiltrate here and just kind of be annoying, but white prevented it. And so now I'm trying on the other side of the board to break down the pawn wall. Now, my clock was running really low at this point, and so I had to calculate pretty deep into these lines where I took each of these pawns. Um, I decided on f takes e, which according to the computer is the wrong choice, but white is plus three or four here anyway, even though material is equal because it's just such a strong initiative and I'm just getting absolutely smothered. But white actually didn't play this quite perfectly either, and Actually, after all the exchanges, we have an equal game again. So it went from plus three or four all the way back down to an evaluation of zeros across the board. But I had to be really accurate here to hold it all together. But the thing is, with fewer pieces on the board, uh, my plans were just a lot simpler, even though I was really down bad on time. I needed to attack White's loose pieces here while simultaneously moving to prevent these passers from advancing at all. I had less than a minute on the clock at some points, but because I got 10 seconds added per move, I kind of just had to make quick, safe moves to build up the time on my clock. So White offered a queen trade, I declined because I was hoping to keep my attacking pieces on the board as long as possible and just sort of hold off these dangerous pawns but eventually white forced the trade here with the check and we actually repeated moves and for a brief joyous moment i thought he might be offering a draw by repetition but he must have decided there were still chances and so he moved his rook all the way back and we didn't repeat three times so we ended up trading off rooks and we got into an opposite colored bishop endgame which if you know your endgames is usually a draw it's just impossible for either side to make progress and once the kings get forward, they can just sort of hold all the pawns together and it's just a draw. So I was in a drawn position against a grandmaster. So he activated his king going after my pawns, which luckily my bishop could defend. All I had to do was go here. Unfortunately, I forgot about the threat that I had been defending against for the last 20 moves. And instead I went here. Oh no. And with that just one moment of loss of focus, I blundered away my drawing potential against a grandmaster and I got mated five moves later. So I played this move way too quickly. I was really conscious of my time deficit and so I was thinking a little bit too long term because I've played these kind of positions before. Um, I wanted my bishop and this pawn to sort of mutually defend each other, and then I was planning to bring the king up. But unfortunately, I forgot about the one threat that could end the game in the next five moves, and I allowed this pass pawn through, and it was over. As frustrating as this last second blunder was, I was really proud of how long I'd lasted. I got checkmated on move 55, and I think I was the last game of the entire simul to finish up. Overall, this was such a great experience. I had so much fun playing this game against Grandmaster Diego, and I'm super grateful for the opportunity. I would highly recommend playing in a simul against a stronger player if you ever do get the chance. You know, if nothing else, it gives you a really high level game to analyze, plus a pretty cool story. Like, I almost drew against a Grandmaster.
Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing. I also just want to say a huge thank you for all the support I've been receiving on this channel over the past couple of weeks. It's been just overwhelmingly positive and amazing, and I really do appreciate it. I'll see you next time.